Thank you. Can we have the house lights up just a bit so I can see you? That's much better. Ha! Huh. Right now, when the world's in such a mess, well, let me just take a reality check with you. How many people here think that in terms of pollution, the environment, the economy, employment, war, the world's in a mess? Okay. And how many people, if they could, would like to do something about it? Oh, great. Terrific. Well, um, my job is to turn that wish to contribute that we all have into a project that works. I don't do advice. But what I can do is share a bit about my own experience. I can share some tools. And I can introduce you to some people your own age who are just amazing. When I was about a couple of years younger than most of you, I was watching a grainy black and white TV. And I saw Soviet tanks charging into Budapest in Hungary and crushing to death people my age. And I rushed upstairs and started packing my suitcase. And my mother came up and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to Budapest. And she said, what for? And I said, it, there's something going on there. We have to do something. And she said, don't be silly. And I said, I've, I just burst into tears. And she got it. She got how much it meant to me here. So she said, look, you need some training if you're going to be any use. So in my next school holiday, <clears throat> she sent me off to work in a holiday home for concentration camp survivors. And there I was, sitting in sunny Suffolk, peeling potatoes in a garden and listening to an old man who was telling me about having his face pushed in the mud while a guard kicked his head in. He showed me the wounds. And that hit my heart. I couldn't compute how one human being could do that to another human being. So I figured out I need to know something about psychology. So I went to university. And at university, I spent most of my time protesting or on a demo or on hunger strike. And I was told I was difficult. It wasn't difficult. I was just passionate. I had to do something. So I took myself off to the very southern part of Africa, where I had a boyfriend. And I worked there for 10 years, uh, moving food surpluses to places where people were starving. And I got married, and I had a beautiful baby girl. And soon after that, I got a brain disease. And um, I was in a coma for a couple of weeks. And when I woke up, I was told I'd lost a third of my brain cells. And then I had headaches like you couldn't imagine for six years. And I tell you this because there was one question that went round and round in my head. And that was, who am I and what am I doing here? And now I'm grateful for those questions, which I couldn't answer, because they led me to the necessity of self-knowledge. And I mention that to you because, to me, it's now become an essential prerequisite for doing something effectively. Why? Because people who are motivated to save the world are often driven by anger or fear. And if all we do is spew anger and fear out onto other people, it's completely ineffective. What we have to do is learn to contain that, that fire, that emotion, and use it as an engine, because it's powerful fuel. And the other thing we really need is empathy. Um, I, was, I was really angry as a teenager and incredibly critical. 
And what I couldn't do at that age was step into the shoes of somebody else. I couldn't understand what it was like to be somebody else. And empathy is quite different from sympathy, which is like pity. Empathy is being able to see what it's like to be in another person's heart. And that is what we need to be able to be, like, like we just heard, to be able to be vulnerable. It sounds paradoxical, but that's when we're at our most useful. So this led me into developing the tools of a peace mediator, which is basically what I do. And I'd like to quickly share some of those tools for you, which work just as well in a hot conflict, we're shooting conflict, as it does in a conflict with your best friend or your family or your school. So, step one, you have to get a helicopter, you have to rise above, get perspective on the conflict. Take a helicopter view. Look uh, into the future and just think what this conflict will do if it escalates and it might ruin your life. So you're going to do something about it. So the first thing to do is to ask the other person if they're willing to talk with you person to person. They're willing to talk, sit down and talk with you not about who's right and who's wrong, but about what it feels like, what it's like in the heart. And when they say yes, you sit down, you ask them to speak in the first person and not blame or accuse. They may find this difficult, but you hold them to it. And you're asking them to talk about what it really feels like for them, what the conflict feels like, and what they need. Because that's the interesting part. And your job while they're speaking is to listen like you have never listened before. So you don't react, you don't say, oh, but. You just try and hear what's going on in that other person's heart. And when they've finished, you feed it back to them. You say, what I heard you say was this. And what I conclude you were feeling was this. And they'll be knocked out that you have listened to them that carefully. It's not easy, but you can do it. So what you're doing is letting them know that their side of it has got through to you. Then it's your turn, and you do the same. You stick to the first person, you say, I felt this, I thought that, and so forth. Um, and when you've finished, you ask them to feed back to you what they heard, including what they think your feelings were. And when you've finished this, you'll find that both of you shift onto a different plane. Instead of being on the plane of the head, which is right and wrong, you're on the plane of the heart. You're connecting. You're reaching out to each other as human beings, not as opponents. And that's the moment when you can begin to sit down and mediate some sort of agreement with the other person. What would it take for us to lay this to rest? What could we agree to do? And when could we agree to do it by? And you make that agreement. And then the last step, which is in a way the most important, is to show respect. Now, in all our work, all over the world, we find that humiliation is the biggest driver of conflict. Think about it. Iraq, Afghanistan, everywhere. Humiliation drives conflict. And the best antidote to humiliation is respect. So your job is to think of something about that other person that you respect and tell them and they will be knocked out for a second time. And they may return it, and they may not. Now, I don't know why this kind of very simple knowledge isn't taught in schools. 
because school students are incredibly good at this. They can defuse rows in school. They can teach their parents how to do it. And it works. So it's, it's a skill you've got for life if you can learn this. And what I did with those tools was to set up an organization called Peace Direct. And Peace Direct believes in local people. It believes that in any conflict, however hot, local people knows, know best what needs to be done. And uh, what we do is to identify people in 20 hot conflict areas throughout the world, the people who are doing the most effective work, and we get behind them and we promote their work and make them known. One of those is Gululai Ishmael. Now, probably you've all heard of Malalai Yousafzai, who got shot in the head for opposing the Taliban over girls' education in Pakistan, and she's recovering right now in a hospital in Birmingham. Well, Malalai and Gululai are friends. I'll see if I can show them to you. And um, they, there they are together. And what Gululai does now as well as opposing the Taliban on girls' education, is she's set up a network of peace activists all over Western Pakistan and the most dangerous area to stop the spread of militantism and find particularly young men who are being trained to be jihadis and bring them back into a more positive way of expressing what they, what they want and need. And uh, Gululai is... She's, she's, she did this because she met a woman who was holding the body of her 12-year-old son who had died uh, as a jihadi. Uh, Gulilai gets her life threatened every day, but she just carries on. She doesn't care. So how do we, you here in this room, translate this passion to do something into something that will actually work? Well, you don't have to look very far. The first place to look is what moves you. What actually sets you going? What breaks your heart? And then think about what it is that lights you up. What are you best at? And bring the two together. So you use what you love doing, what you're really good at, what you find easy, and you bring it together with what you really care about. Um, now, that could be something like trees. There's a young guy called Felix in Germany who, when he was nine, had to do a school project on a Monday morning, so he surfed the web all weekend. And he found out about Wangari Matai, daughter of a Kenyan farm laborer who, um, decided that she wanted to reforest Kenya. 45 million trees planted later, she got the Nobel Peace Prize. So Felix thought, if she could do so much with so little, why can't we kids in Germany do something? So he started a project called Plant for the Planet. It's now in 131 countries. And the branch, if you'll forgive me, is about to start in the UK and he wants to plant a million trees in the UK. So that's one thing that you could get involved in or you could start your own. Or you may really care about children like those incredible photographs, films that we saw this morning. Um, there's a little girl in America who's only, I think she's only 14, who uh, realized, realized that she wanted to do something <coughs> for children in her neighborhood. So she, she was good at making lemonade, she loved making fruit juices, she opened a stall in the street, started selling this, she got filmed, it went viral, and now she's raised, I think, five million dollars for children in her area. So it's a question of marrying these two that really, really matters. Um, there's people up the road in Birmingham who are defusing gang fights and teaching other people how to do it using theatre. Okay, so I started off or uh, and sort of gave you an idea how important it is to listen. Now I want to conclude 
with telling you when not to listen. If, people, if you start to tell somebody about your idea and they look bored and tell you you're naive, don't listen. If you find something that really matters to you and you start to develop it and you go along to somebody uh, and ask them for help and they just shrug and turn away, take no notice. If you've developed your project fully and you want to get it on television and you walk into a studio and try to get them interested in it and they say you're mad, don't listen. Remember what Mahatma Gandhi said. He said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then you fight them, then you win. Thank you.